Let's go ahead and uh, turn to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4. Glory to God. We've been talking on a series for a little while called Dressed for Success, Real Spiritual Warfare. And so the last, uh, we're, we're kind of winding things down. We've, 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 traveled, we've traveled a good distance in this series, and uh, we're, kind of, we're, we're kind of winding ourselves down here. We are talking about our weapons. Because 2 Corinthians, if I can get into the 2 Corinthians, there we go. 10 verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural. They're not physical. They're not stuff that we would, um, we're, we're able to lay hold of in regards to our hands and, and uh, we can't drive it, we can't shoot it, we can't swing it with our hands. It's not something that's natural. But even though it's not natural or it's not carnal, doesn't mean, number one, it doesn't exist, and number two, doesn't mean that it's not effective. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Amen? And so uh, the Satan is very aware of these weapons. <laughs> He's very aware of them. I mean, he come up on the end of it when Jesus walked on the earth. The end of that sword. And uh, uh, he, he sure knows what that's all about. And so as we are clothed and cloaked in the armor of God, we've got the same sword of the Spirit and so that's the, one of the things that we we're talking about, um, uh, one of those weapons. What was one of the weapons? The Word of God. Ephesians talks about um, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so when we use the sword, and we got the faceplate down on our, on our helmet, uh, the devil has no idea who's inside there, who's inside that armor, Right? He's not sure if it's Jesus or who, but I mean, he, it's the same result every time. We run him off. We win because Jesus won for us. So the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And we saw how Jesus used that in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 back in the beginning of the series when we actually talked about the sword of the Spirit. But I don't want to focus as much on the sword of the Spirit, because we already talked about that, as much as I want to focus on the Word part. What is our weapons? The Word of God. Why is the Word so powerful? Well, last week we talked about that, that God said He's exalted His Word even above His name, and that words create. Amen? Words create. They have, they, they are a creative force. They are powerful and they are weapons because they can create the kingdom of God in our life and in our situation. They can create God's will and plan. In other words, they can destroy the works of the devil if we dare put them to work in our lives. Amen? That's powerful. So, so today, I want to talk about, let's go to Proverbs chapter 18. Today, I want to talk about, start talking about anyways right now, that words rule. Words rule. Why are words dangerous? Because words rule. <laughs> Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21, Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. When it talks about the power of the tongue, God is talking about what? He's talking about words. The words that we speak. Life and death are in the power of the words that we speak. 
And he said, they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. So our words produce fruit. Our words produce results. Just as a tree produces fruit, just as in the garden your plants produce fruit. I mean, you can get tomatoes, you can get carrots, you can get potatoes, you can get beans, you can get uh, a bunch of things, right? But just as the plant produces a fruit or a result, our words produce results. And he said that life and death are those results, right? Life and death are in the power of our words. They that love to speak words of life produce crops of life. Those that love to speak words of death produce crops of death. That's what we see there. And, and so, you understand that, that our crop is not determined by the will of God. Our crop is not determined by what's written in the Word of God. Our crop is determined by, by what we choose to say with our mouth. We determine our crop. God has a will. He has a plan. And we have a choice. <laughs> there are many people that are already gone from this planet who did not take advantage of the life. They, did, they chose not to receive God's plan, His will. They didn't speak words of life. They didn't enjoy life. And they've got no choice now. But everyone that's alive on the planet right now, even though they may have been in the habit of speaking death, oh, my feet are killing me, oh, I mean, I'm just, I'm dying to go, and, and, and all this kind of stuff, you know, uh, talk about their car, their car might be a good car, but it, it acts up, and then they call it a piece of junk, and they kick it, and they, 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 they just speak bad about it. They talk about their bodies the same way, you know, they hit 30 and they start talking old I'm just getting old I'm just getting old wow I'm not like was I was when I was 22 I'm thinking you you need to step away from me before I slap you real hard <laughs> you know don't talk like that you speak words of life over your body you you call yourself youthfully renewed hallelujah amen you know, we talk life over our bodies. We talk life over our vehicles. We talk life. See, Matthew's getting his car, and I'm, we're telling him, okay, you're going to start to have to speak life over your car. Our vehicles last long. They, they work perfectly because we tell them to. We, we talk to them. <laughs> now you're going to have to, now that it's under your ownership, you're going to have to start talking to your vehicle yourself. You have to learn these things. There's these things you need to, to, to take on. Well, you know what? It, it's, it's not just for him. It's still for all of us. And there's a lot of people that, that have no clue that what they say makes any difference. And they just kick the dirt in the dust and go, boy, I just, it's just not fair. It's not fair. As if fair has anything to do with it. Like, who cares? It's a choice. It's a choice. God has made it very fair. Everybody has the opportunity to speak life or death. The choice is presented to everyone. Speak whatever you want. But most people aren't speaking what they want, they're speaking what they have. And they keep having what they have instead of changing to get what they want. Words rule. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Hallelujah. We, we must speak. We must talk. If we want things to change, we must speak. We must talk to make things change. If we want things to stay the same, then we need to keep speaking what we've been speaking to maintain and to keep things. And if we want to increase, then we need to speak and change in regards to increase. Amen? Our words 
make a difference. And sometimes when you've got momentum, it's, it's, it's easier to just stay with the flow. But sometimes when we're trying to change something, it might not seem like things change right away. Well, I said that, you know, a few times. I said that for a week. I, I said it for a month. Yeah, but you've been saying something else for 20 years. I mean, so it's some things. It, did you know it takes a little while to get the train stopped? Especially if he's got more than just himself bo bo boogieing down the, rat, the, the, the tracks. I mean, if he's got himself, you know, 100 train cars behind him, it takes a while to stop. And not only does it take a while to stop, it takes a while to get going. And if I just, without having any idea, my opinion might be it's probably quicker to stop than it is to get going. Because you got probably a whole bunch of brakes that you can actually get going and, and lock in a bunch of those cars up. I mean, the, I'm sure they got it set up to where they can stop quicker. But when you get going, you still only have one engine. Or maybe you got two engines. But uh, not all those, the rest of those cars, they're just along for the ride. <laughs> they got no power. They, they're, just, they're just lazy. They just, they just hang there and go, pull me, you know. Um, and so uh, it takes a while to get going. So don't get discouraged when you change your words for your benefit. You change the word, your words, you start speaking words of life, and things don't seem to happen overnight. Don't get discouraged. It takes a while for the train to get going. It takes a while for momentum to kick in. It takes a while. It doesn't, have to, it doesn't take forever, but it can take a while. And that while yeah. is not exactly the same for everyone. So, we just need to function where we're at, where our faith is, and just run and speak constant and consistent. Amen? Amen? But the truth of the matter is life and death is in the power of the tongue, the power of our words, and we will eat the fruit of what we talk. Words rule. Life and death. Let's go to, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. You know what? We can even back up to, um, where are we going to go back up to? We're going to back up to verse 35. A good man from his inner good treasure flings forth good things. How does he do that? With words. And the evil man, out of his inner evil storehouse flings forth evil things. How does he do that? With words. Look at this, verse 36. But I tell you, Jesus speaking, I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will have to give account for every idle, inoperative, non-working word they speak. For by your words you will be justified and acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned and sentenced. Words rule. And they will come back to us. Jesus said that we will be justified and acquitted. We'll be condemned and sentenced. And not only in the day of judgment, but there is, court is in session at this very moment. Heaven's courtroom is in operation. And the accuser of the brethren is continually bringing accusations against us. And the Bible says in regards to the, court, the courtroom, he can use our words against us. So, every, what's that thing? Every word... The words that you say um, will be used against you. 
What's that phrase? No, what do the police officers say? To you. Anything you say can and will be used against you. That is what Jesus said right here. I tell you on the day of judgment, and then we'll give account of every evil, our idle, inoperative, un non-working word they speak. And your words you will be justified and acquitted. And by your words you will be condemned and sentenced. Satan is bringing up our words before the Father. And so when we speak curse words, when we... Now I'm not talking about swearing words. I'm talking about so swearing words are kind of like inoperative words. <laughs> They're fillers that we will still be accountable for. But we speak words that are, that are um, uh, uh, speaking words of death, words of curse, um, words of lack, words of sickness, words of poverty, words of, words of I can't and it won't, and, and words of defeat. These kind of words Satan uses against us. He says, God, you can't, you can't do that. For example, um, Robert Henderson. That was his first name, Robert Henderson. Again, his son was a minister. His life fell apart. His wife left him and um, ministry fell apart. And, and uh, um, so his dad is praying for him, praying for him, praying for him. For a couple of years, praying for him, praying for him. And him and his wife are sitting at the table and he said, I don't understand why he doesn't get it. I don't understand why he doesn't, he doesn't just stand up against us. I, 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 don't, I don't understand why he doesn't climb out of this. Why he doesn't do anything about it. And they're praying and they're praying and they're standing and they're rebuking the devil and they're binding Satan. And, and uh, two years of this. And then one day, the Lord brings him to heaven. And he saw the courtrooms. And the Lord began to talk to him about the, about the courtrooms. And he said... Now, your son is at a point where he is not able to stand up for himself. So I need you to intercede on his behalf. I need you to pray for him. I need you to, re to repent for him. So he said, okay, so he repented for him. And then the Lord told him, now I need you to repent. He said, me? Why do I need to repent? He said, because the accuser, the accuser of the family, the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the family of God, the devil keeps bringing up words that you have said, and it's hindering me from being able to move on your son's behalf. He said, words that I said, like what? He said, he said the accuser keeps saying, you said... He can't. He can't change. He, he's, he's not standing up. He can't do it. He can't change. And what? He doesn't get it. Why doesn't he get it? And so he said, I can't do anything for him because you said he doesn't get it. So I can't help him get it because you said he can't get it. I need you to repent of those words so they can be erased from the book so Satan has a gag order put on him so he can't keep bringing before me what you said against your son. Oh, I repent of those words. And the blood washed it clean. The books have been erased. And now there's nothing to give account for because it's gone. Nothing the, the accuser who's bringing a, a charge against us, there's nothing the, the accuser can bring a charge. There's nothing he can use to bring a charge against us. 
And so now the God who is our righteous judge can now begin to speedily avenge us. Amen? Our words make a difference. Words rule. Words rule. In the courtroom of heaven, our words rule. It's not God's will that rules. God had a will and his words overrode God's will. And God said, you want my will, you need to repent of those words. Because words rule. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we will eat the fruit thereof. We will eat life or death. We need to change what we say if we don't like what we have. And there are words that we need to repent over. So they get washed out. The devil cannot use them against us. There are words that have been said against us that we need to repent. Lord, I repent for those people that said those things. I put an end to those words affecting my life. In Jesus' name. Amen? Words are powerful. Idle words, just, we will be, there are idle words, there are words that we will be justified by, and there are words that we will be condemned by. So we need to deal with them. Because they don't just disappear. They, they, they don't just spoken in a quiet room, spoken alone, spoken to ourselves in the middle of the night. Nobody knows. Yes, those words are coming back. So we must guard our mouth. As King David said, guard my mouth. Guard my mouth. Lord, help me to guard what I say. Help me put a guard over my mouth. Help me to say what you say. And that's why it's important. When we were talking about binding and loosing, in order for our words to be effective... We need to believe what we say. And if we're, in the use, if we're used to just saying whatever we want to say, uh, I don't believe, I'm just joking, I don't mean that. It's just, uh, too much of that can lessen our faith or our confidence in our words. Words rule. So, we must value and respect them. Amen? Can, can you see the ne next step? Since words rule, since words create, it's very important that we value and respect words. Let's talk about God's Word for a moment. I just want to go through a few scriptures. We'll kind of see where we go. We may get into our second weapon. But I just want to quickly kind of go through some things. God's Word. John 17, 17. Let's just hit a few scriptures here. John 17, 17. Find out about God's Word. God's Word. What the Bible says about God's Word. We must value and respect God's Word. Why? Because John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through your truth. Your Word is truth. Amen? So, so the Word of God is truth. Whether we like it or not, whether anybody likes it or not, this Word is truth. It's truth. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's, I guess, I mean, one of the primary reasons why we, not, we must value and respect God's Word is because it's truth. It's not just an opinion. This is not just God's opinion. No, no, it's truth. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we can read that's just opinion. And there's some good opinions and some bad opinions. But what, what makes good opinion, what makes opinions good is, is how closely they line up with the truth. <laughs> right? And you can have bad opinions. I mean, a bunch of people might believe it, but that doesn't make it good. I mean, they, that's, uh, that's, that's a terrible opinion. Um, a lot of people believe it, but it's not even remotely close to the Word of God. It's contrary to the Word of God. So that's what makes it a bad opinion. <laughs> not how many people are uh, jumped on the bandwagon. 
Truth is truth. Truth doesn't change. This is not the B-I-B-L-1, the B-I, yeah, B-L, B-I-B-L-E 1.5. No, this, this, this isn't the latest update. The Bible's been the same. Now, different translations because it was written in a language that actually has lots of words that, that a Greek word or a Hebrew word can mean. So you can have a bunch of translations that they're all saying the same thing using some different words because it's the same thing said in Hebrew. That's why I like the Amplified Bible too. They add some extra words there because that, that one Greek word, it's one word, but it's got this many words in the English that can be used to describe it. Or it's the same word. So it's, uh, it's fun. The Word of God is fun. The Word of God is amazing. It's truth. Glory to God. And then John 6, chapter 63, or John 6, verse 63. John 6, 63. We must value and respect words. God's Word, John 6, 63. Jesus said this, It is spirit. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And if we tie that with Hebrews 4.12, let's go to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. See, my words, they are spirit and they are life. They're not just, they're not just letters on a page. They're not like news in a newspaper. They're not just a report. They are spirit and they are life. And if we tie Hebrews 4.12, says this, Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick, it's alive, it is life. And it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints in the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is alive. It's spirit and life. And so that's why when we speak the Word of God to our body, it changes. When we call our body healed, when we speak to, our, speak to a part of our body, it changes. It, it has to line up with the Word of God because we're speaking life into that part. When we speak, amen, when we spoke these words, Jesus, I make you my Lord. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, take my life and do something with it. Those are not just words. They're spirit and they're life. And what they do is, is they literally have authorized the creator of heavens and the earth, the almighty God, to move on the inside of us and cause our spirit that was dead, eternally separated from him, destined for hell, no life in it, to go boom, to come alive. We were made new creatures in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we were beamed out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. Translated just like that. From the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. From the kingdom of death into the kingdom of life. The kingdom of God. Just like that. Just like that. His words, their spirit and their life. That's why he said, we have authority. And when we bind the devil and when we cast him out, resist the devil and he what? He flees. He has to flee. He's got no choice. Because the words are alive. And they're powerful. They contain God's power, His life, His authority. They're containers. And we release those words. We release those containers. And they make an impact. They have an impact. They create an impact. As we spent time, words create. Glory to God. Last week, they'll do it. God's Word. They are spirit and they're life. They're truth. They're alive and powerful. That's why we must value and respect these words. 
<laughs> hold these words in high esteem because God said them. God said them. These are covenant words. These are blood-bought words. We're going we're gonna to move into our next series. We're going to move into this a little bit. These are blood-bought words. It's impossible for these words to fail. They're alive. They're powerful. They're blood-bought. God spoke them. He's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. What he said he'll do, he'll do. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. So let's go to 1 Peter 1. We're very close there in Hebrews. 1 Peter 1. A few pages over. 1 Peter 1 and 22. Starting in verse 22. Hallelujah. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. Oh, there's the Word of God. Hallelujah. The Word of God has what? The ability to purify our souls. It's called renewing our mind. Through the Spirit unto unfeigned love or real love of the brethren or the family. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently being born again not of corruptible seed but of the incorruptible by the word of God which lives and abides forever for all flesh is like grass and all the glory of man or men is as the the flower of grass the grass withers and the flower thereof falls or fails falls away verse 25 but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. So we said two times we see it here. The word of God which lives and abides forever. The word of the Lord endures forever. It lives and endures forever. The word of God lives and endures forever. Did you know that's a long time? That, that's, 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 that's even longer than we can think. It, it's, it's beyond. I mean, we think people are living, you know, we're living to 100, 120, and, and then we go back to Genesis, and so-and-so lived to 900 and something, and so-and-so lived to 900 and something, and we, we, can, we, can, uh, we can't really comprehend that because it's not even remotely close, but I mean, the Bible said it, so we believe it. It's like almost a, almost a, um, uh, a thousand years, and, and then the Bible talks about forever. Forever. Eternity. Forever. We can't even, we can't even, we can't even grasp that. It, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to put a measurement to it. You know when you're younger and something, young people talk about a mile. A mile. Well, a mile. You, you, you get the concept of a mile, but you, you have, you have no, what is a mile? Well, then, then I remember my parents talked about, generally, I mean, we lived in the city here, generally a mile is 10 city blocks. All of a sudden, that put a concept in my mind that I could now understand what a mile is. You know, when you go to the racetrack and they race a quarter mile. Okay, that's a quarter mile. Okay, well, well that's a, still a fair ways. A quarter mile. And they race a quarter mile. And, and uh, then all of a sudden you throw a kilometer in there and it's like, what's a, what's a kilometer? Well, it's now... There's 1.6 kilometers in a mile. Oh, so I'm still thinking of a mile. Uh, all right, so now that's like six blocks. Oh, six blocks. Okay, you know, and, and you, 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 have to, you have to grasp some of this stuff. You have to get a picture where you can understand it. You might understand the wording. Oh, yeah, I understand what you're talking about, but I have no idea. You know, when people would talk about an acre. An acre. Well, that, sounds, that sounds like it's bigger than a yard. I'm not talking about a yard as in three feet. I'm talking about like, you know, the yard we have in the city. <laughs> this is my yard. Okay, but it sounds like an acre is bigger than our yard. And, but I still had no idea what's an acre. I have no idea what's an acre. 
You know, people say they got a, we've got a thousand acres. Well, how am I going to how am I going to break that down into a thousand to figure out what an acre is? I have no idea until I then moved to Sarnia and pastored a church and and uh, um, our church was on twenty acres, so I could at least see what twenty acres looked like. And 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 the church itself, I mean, fifteen acres we had basically leased out for to farm farmers for crops, so I could see what 15 acres of corn or 15 acres of beans looked like. And, and then the church was kind of on five acres, and, and uh, about a portion of it was uh, utilities uh, on the corner. And, and then I lived in the parsonage in the end, and, and so it was on, I think it was on a couple acres. And so I got to, to understand a little bit more what an acre was like. But just to throw a word out, we can understand the word, we can understand the context of the word, but that doesn't mean we understand what it is. Does that make sense? And so, when we talk about forever, all we just know is it's a long time. <laughs> right? We, we, you can't see the end of it. it. It's a long time. The word of God abides. It lives. It's good for however long that is. So, so, so it's good for us today, right? I mean, if it's good until way, way out then and beyond that, forever, forever doesn't even have an end. And so, so that means it's good for us today. It's good for us today. It lives and abides forever. We must value and respect this word because it's good. It's truth forever. It's truth forever. Hallelujah. God's Word. So what do I see when, I, when I've read this stuff? What, what, what do I think of? As I was praying this week, the Lord just, He added something else into my notes here. He said, I, saw, I see God's Word is predictable, and it's the same for everyone. God's Word is predictable, and it's the same for everyone. Do you know what makes flight safe? The law of gravity. The law of gravity is constant. So if you want to go higher, you put the power on. And you do your stuff with your flaps and your and everything, and it makes you go higher. And you want to stop going higher? You just slow down a bit. Straighten out, and you can fly like this. And you get to the point where, you know what? I'm tired of flying like this. I actually want to land. And we want to let all the people out. All right. Because what? We've made it to our destination. Gravity is predictable. You just slow down some more and gravity will start sucking you down. It's predictable. Every single time. There are laws put in motion. And they land. I mean, if you can figure out how to land one or two or three times and you kind of got it down to where people go like this, good, good job. That was a good job. That wasn't just a fluke. You did it again and again. You can do it. It's like riding a bike. You can not ride a bike for a long time and you can hop on and you can ride your bike because why? Because you figured out balance. Gravity is constant. You lean too much this way, you're going to fall that way. You lean too much this way, you fall that way. But if you throw speed and a curve in there, you see r racing motorcycles, they go around the curve where the guy's leaning. The seat of his bike is up here. He's got his handlebars like this, and he's, he's barely hanging on to his bike, and he's got this knee dragging on the ground, and he's got a plate on his knee so it doesn't burn. And he goes around, bzzz, around the corner, racing. Why? Because gravity is constant. What if gravity just decided to, it, just, it would just hiccup every now and then? That guy going around the corner, don't hiccup when I'm going around the corner. All of a sudden, who knows what happens? See, when I was, another story. When I was in high school, my teacher rode motorcycles. And so one of my teachers, not, not all my teachers, one of my teachers, um, and he took a trip west. And he's coming back. And he was coming back, and he was beyond Banff, between Banff and Calgary. And he's coming back home, and, and he got a wobble. He got a wobble going. And, and you, once you get the wobble going, it's, it's very hard to stop. And it just went boom, 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 and he wiped out. And so his bike was towed into Cochrane. 
So the good news is, when he comes to school the next day, or the middle of the week, whenever it was, I have a truck. So this is probably, I guess it was grade 12. I have a truck. So I was asked to go pick his bike up. Leave school and go pick his bike up. Le leave school and pick his bike up. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I'll volunteer every time. So, so, but I said, uh, I can't go by myself. I need to have a couple buddies with me. So I had one or two friends with me. And since we were in Cochrane, we had to stop for Cochrane ice cream. So we had ice cream and picked up the bike, came back and dropped the bike off at the end of the school day. And so he's happy and we're happy. But you see, you start getting some wobble going on. So if you get gravity acting funny, you can, you can, life can get wobbles in it. And it can be very dangerous. But it's constant. It's constant. It's predictable. Amen? See, when I was, when I was pastoring in Sarnia, I had, um, we had a stage. And I told my friend who was, um, uh, ran the camera ministry and, and he worked for the cable company and so we got some of their uh, equipment and uh, I, said, I said, now there's going to be a point in my message when, when, when I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to kick a chair off of the stage and I'm going to jump in the air. So, so what I need you to do is when you see me getting up on the stage and moving towards this chair, I need you to switch from camera one to camera two. And camera two needs to be a wide shot because you need to catch all this. And so when I kicked the chair, it didn't fly and hit a lady over there. Why? No, no, because gravity makes it go like this. Badunk. Right? Because chairs don't fly. Gravity makes it go badunk, badunk, badunk. And when I jumped... I didn't, I didn't have to be afraid of hitting my head on the ceiling. No, I jumped because the ceiling was high and I landed on the ground. And so my buddy, that's the story they always tell. Oh, Pastor Jeff, we enjoy, enjoy him. He's got funny stuff. You don't know when he's going to jump off the stage. And so, you know, <laughs> the, first time, the first time he meets my wife and he's telling her this story. And so, um, gravity... It's predictable. It's predictable. The Word of God is predictable. It's truth. It endures forever. It's alive and powerful. It's spirit and life. It's that way all the time. We can depend on it. We can have confidence in it. When we put it to work, it will work. When we say what it says, it'll do what it says. Amen? It's predictable every time. And you know what? That makes it, if people want to use the word fair, that makes it fair. Because it works for everyone. It works for everyone. But you see, the fair people, they, they don't think that's fair. They, 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 they want the same results you get for speaking and doing the word without them having to do it. Eh? it, it it's like, it's like, it's like chips, it's like chips, um, a chip brims um, uh, athletes that um, they, they had their big championship rings on walking through the mall. And some of the other students would come up from other schools and go, oh man, I want one of those. And they said, well, come to our school. No, 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 no. We know how hard you work. <laughs> they want the ring without the work. Huh? And there's too many people in this world who want the result without the work. They want the result without the effort. No, they want the success without the years or decades prior to it that made it to where it was. They want the end result without the beginning. They want the fruit without the planting. Huh? We want the harvest, but we don't want any do that plowing stuff, and we don't want any of that seed sowing stuff. Pfft, no way. Just, just give me the harvest. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. The Word of God is predictable, and it's the same for everyone. 
So we look at people like Brother Copeland and we look at people like Jesse and we look at people like uh, the, the pastors in Nigeria or they got 50,000, you know, what, 10 services of 50,000 or they got, you know, the same word. We have the same word and we have the same God. Amen? Amen? And if someone else has done it, we know it's possible. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's not worth getting discouraged about. It's worth getting rejoicing about. We've seen it's been done. And it can be done bigger than that. They stretched and got something bigger than was, and there's, some, there's still something bigger than that because God cannot be tapped out. God is just God who's more than enough. Amen? Hallelujah. God's Word is predictable and the same for everyone. Glory to God forevermore. So, let's go to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. We talked about God's Word. We need to respect and honor God's Word. Now I want us to step over and start talking about our words. Your, your and my words. We need, to, we need to respect and value our own words. Respect and value our own words. Mark chapter 11 verse 23 says this, For verily I say unto you that whosoever, whoever, Say whoever. That, that, means, that means this is, he's talking about anybody. Anybody and everybody. Amen? Whoever. Whoever shall say unto this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that the things which they say shall come to pass, they shall have whatever they say. Whosoever. Whosoever shall say. Amen? Whosoever shall say to the mountain. Whosoever, whatever that mountain is. Whatever the mountain that may be standing in our way. What, whatever mountain it may be that's casting a shadow in our lives. Whatever, whatever the mountain that might be. That's hindering and holding back things from getting to us. Amen? Whatever the mountain may be, whoever will talk to the mountain and will say, be cast into the sea, get out of my life, I resist you, go in Jesus' name, whatever it might be, whatever we're talking to the mountain, and you shall not doubt in your heart, but you shall believe that the things that you say shall come to pass, you shall have whatever you say. Do you know what that means? That means we can have whatever we say if we believe what we say. So we must value and respect what we say. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Because we only have what we say if we believe it. We don't have what we say if we don't believe it. And the longer we keep saying what we don't believe, it can change to where we start believing what we used to not believe. You tell a fish story or a lie long enough, you will start remembering history as your fish story and lie. And if there was actually a picture taken or, or an audio recording of something and someone says, no, that's not how it happened. Oh, yeah, I have a picture. What a, no way. You mean I've been believing this? No, you've been telling the lie or the fish story for so long, it twisted what you believed. To where you forgot reality. 
So that's why we must value and respect our words and the Word of God. Say what we believe. And if we read something in the Word of God and we don't believe that, but we want to believe that, then it's very important that we begin to speak and we begin to say, I believe that. I believe that. We begin to say and we begin to school ourselves into believing what He said. Amen? Because there's some stuff we believe that's contrary to this. Have you figured that out yet? But we're supposed to believe this. And so what we do is we, we actually use our words to get us to believe this. We use our words and choose to believe what we say in regards to the Word of God. See, from when I was young, I like milk. I like milk. You can ask my parents. I drank milk all the time. I'd have milk in the morning. I'd have milk in the afternoon. I'd make, have milk at supper time. I'd have milk before I went to bread. I had milk. Milk. I like milk. They spent a lot of money on milk for me. I, maybe it's not as expensive back then, but I mean, they, I, I like milk. White milk, chocolate milk. I like milk. I really like milk. And then <clears throat> I went to the U.S., took a two-month vacation, visited some friends, and, and ate, and ate, and ate. And then I was in Mississippi with some friends, and, and um, her brother worked at a restaurant, and so we'd go at, you know, 10 o'clock at night to go pick him up as he's closing his shift. And, and we'd have brownies and ice cream. I mean, what else are you going to have at 10 o'clock or 10.30 at night? Brownies and ice cream. And, and um, eat and eat. And, and I came back... Um, 15 pounds, maybe 20 pounds, 15 pounds heavier than when I left a couple months before that. So it's like, okay, I need to get rid of this now. So I got on a program, um, a weightlifting, um, uh, it was a, a bodybuilding type program to, to weights and, and um, all the supplements and, and I was doing my working out and everything and, and I got rid of the weight. One of the things I had to get rid of was a lot of the extra fat stuff like ice cream and milk. And all I drank is homogenized milk. You know, thick stuff. Not the cream, but it, next, next thing to cream, homogenized. Homogenized milk, that's all we drank. Homogenized milk. I drank it, drank it, drank it, drank it, drank it. I, I tried like a 2% once and it's like, this is water. <laughs> this is nasty as water. Give me my homogenized. And so I'm drinking my homogenized. Well, I take What's my eight weeks, eight week program? I got rid of got rid of all that fat. No milk, no ice cream. So I decided to try two percent. And you know what? To me, it tasted exactly the same as homogenized. Why? Because all I've been drinking for two months is water. Water. So you throw in two percent milk fat in water, it tastes like homogenized milk. <laughs> this is thicker. All of a sudden, I am drink, I'm drinking water. I don't want to drink water, I want milk. But, but I, I like water. I like water. I like water. And after a while, I like water. And so now I'm drinking my 2%. I'm drinking my 2%. And then I get into, I moved to Sarnia, Ontario, and I'm pastoring out there. And, 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 and I'm, so I'm, I'm actually starting to work out more. And I'm endeavoring to get rid of some more fat again. And uh, um, I got to the point because now I'm drinking lots of water and some 2%. I got to the point where I can drink 1% and it tasted exactly the same as homogenized 15 years before. Tastes the same. No different to me. So then when I taste the other stuff, it's like, oh, 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 wow, that's lots of cream in that. You know, so it, uh, there's different, but it tasted the same. And then, and then Dr. Don Col Colbert talks about, you know, that... You know, I like my just my reverse osmosis water. And he said, well, it's, it's, it's good to remove impurities, but it also removed all the minerals. So now the minerals are gone. So I had to put the minerals back in. So I got some drops and I put the minerals back in. But, but it, made it, it made it taste, it made it taste real nasty. 
See, I used to, I used to like my reverse osmosis, like, you know, um, you can buy your bottle of waters, reverse osmosis, and, and, and then you can get Evian. Evian has got the minerals still in. And I taste that and I'm like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. So what did I have to do? I had to use my words to begin to change what I thought again. And I would put my drops in and I would drink and go, I like this. This is good. I like this. This is how water is supposed to taste. This, this is good. This is how water is supposed to taste. See, don't let this become too simple for you. I'm teaching you how to change things in your life. Because it did not take one week until that's how normal water tasted. And then one day I went to work and forgot to put drops in my water and I had it the way I used to really, really like it. Oof, whoo! It's, it tasted like it. This is sterile water. There's nothing in this. I need some more. I need my drops because this is nasty. I'm serious. It's nasty. And I used to drink it a lot. But it's nasty now. And so I go, you know, we go somewhere and you get a bottle of water. And I, I mean, if it's just, if it's spring water, it's still got everything in it. But, and it, so it tastes fine. But it, it, the moment you get reverse osmosis by itself, it, it's, it's too sterile. And I'm not, I'm not saying this is the way water is supposed to taste. No, 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 no. My mineral water is the way water is supposed to taste. I already talked myself. I talked myself. I talked myself to believe it. And I talked to myself to, well, that's the way my body likes it now. It didn't like it, but I talked it. I taught it by speaking to it how to believe it. My body changed because of the words in my mouth. You can change things in your life with the words of your mouth. Do you understand what I'm saying? We can have what we say if we believe what we say. And so I would say, this is the way water is supposed to taste. This is delicious. Mmm, I like this. I would, we had to teach our son to do that. I don't like these vitamins. Quit saying you don't like it. Start saying, mmm, this is the vitamins taste good. Mmm, I like these vitamins. You, you need to talk to yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to spend the rest of your life having issues. Because I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. I know that's good for me, but I don't like it. I don't, it's good for me, but I don't like it. And so, you know, if something's good for you and you don't like it, and you don't do it, I know I'm supposed to do that, but I don't like it. I know I'm supposed to do that, but I don't want to do that. I, we start talking to ourselves. And we make changes. Amen? We use our words because the Word of God is predictable. We value and respect our own words. And we can have what we say. You and I can have what we say. Amen? Let's say that together. I can have what I say if I believe in my heart. Amen. We can have what we say. Amen. Glory to God. Well, we'll pick up next week and we'll start talking about the name of Jesus.